Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of GenderIdentityToday.com. If you're already a subscriber, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Subscribers not only receive every piece of new content directly to their email inboxes as soon as it publishes, but they're also able to interact with every contributor directly, and that includes me, which I don't know like a better perk, frankly. So if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, videos, and written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the link to Gender Identity Today that you'll find in the show notes. All right, well, today I am so pleased to be speaking with Catherine Stag Macy. Hi, Catherine. It's great to be here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It, no, thank you. It's been so long since we've spoken, right? What is it, three weeks or so? At least three <laughs> weeks since you came on my podcast, yeah. That's all right, all right. <laughs> I've been missing you. <laughs> I, right, I know. I was like, I need some more Catherine in my life. Exactly. So I need some, yeah, some, some amethyst hair in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So Catherine is an executive coach, ex executive coach. Wow. Hostess of the podcast Unset at Work, which obviously I appeared on, um, which was a phenomenal conversation, by the way. Catherine is a great podcast hostess. I'm just going to throw that out there. Quick plug. Go and listen to Unset at Work. But you are also a finder of lost mojo. Well, love that. It's really good. <laughs> Much of Catherine's work is is uh, designed to motivate her clients to reclaim the purpose and the fun in work. And you know, my much of uh, what we talked about was bringing off it or being authentic at work. And so I thought it'd be a good uh, a good fit for the two of us to talk mm -hmm. here too. Let me start with the the really basic question, Mojo. What can what can get lost? What mojo can you lose in the workplace or just in work? I think it's sort of a feeling of, for me, mojo. When I thought through the word, was about what gets me out of bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. So, your know, passion, meaning, creativity, fulfillment, like that's all encompassed in you know in in mojo, whatever flavor of mojo you might have. Like, what's the thing? You know, what the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning on Monday? Is it to be creative? Is it to bring people together? Is it to have fun? You know, that's the stuff that goes somewhere in your, corp in your corporate career for sure. And we've all been yeah. there. Yeah. When we think of the American dream, which I get it, you're, you're, you're not in the United States, but just like play along for a moment. When I think about the American dream, it's really focused on acquisition. Mm. It's it's focused on, I'm going to make a bunch of money, I'm going to get a big title, so that at the very least I feel respected. Personally, I think there's a there's some untruth in that. But, but you're talking about fulfillment, actual fulfillment in your work, which is different from compensation. Yeah. Why, why is that important? <sighs> If you're going to spend seven, you know, the spirits and God's willing, 70 years on this planet, what are you doing with your one precious life? So when you've got the car that you want and the house that you want and the picket fence and the two and a half kids and the one and a half Labradors, like, <laughs> you know, then what? Like, so the fuck what? Like, and I see it time and time again. People come to me and say, I wanted to be SVP by the time I'm 30 and now I'm there. I'm like, it, it's so anticlimactic. Like, what was the point? So, you know, when we, when we, when we, when we, when we get trained to do this, to be driven by extrinsic motivations, you know, get the A's, get the MBA, get the promotion, get the bonus, um, and we do all that. We, so we play by the rules and then we find inside our souls going like, I, I'm like sort of slightly dying on the vine. Like, what is this? This is right. just meaningless. Yeah. So I think for all of us, and there's some great psychoanalysts who've written about this, like at some, there comes a point in your life where you have to go, well, what, what am I doing? What am I actually doing? 
with my life. And, you know, maybe it's as, I don't want to simplify, but maybe your mojo is to create, you know, is to be a, is to be a parent. Like I have a friend of mine who's like my greatest um, success in my life is being a parent. And you're mm. like, fantastic, you know. Like for me, it's about stopping people playing small. I, I have a history of depression on the family. My father died by suicide. So for me, I'm very right. activated by like fucking wake up, <laughs> you know. It's like because the, 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 the downside, it may not be, I mean, the, the path is not necessarily, is certainly not necessary suicide for everyone, but to, sure. to live a, a life half lived is, is not, it's not what you have to do. It just, there is more available to us. Right. Right. You know, you, that brings to mind that, that quote actually, cause I'm trying to, a, a life, is it life, a life not examined, a life unexamined is half lived something. Yeah, I think the the um, what are you going to do with this one precious life is Mary Oliver, but yeah, the life not examined. Yeah, is yeah, I know that quote. Cause, yes, because I I like to think the opposite. Is that really Mary Oliver? The life with what are you going to do with the one precious life is Mary Oliver. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah, okay. By the way, I love Mary Oliver. I've got a huge anthology. Is that the word I want to yeah, use? Yeah, yeah, huge yeah. complex. I love her. Uh, Mary Oliver and David White are my two mm. uh, big favorites. David White over there in Ireland yes. for you. So. Yes. But the, whatever, however that phrase goes, you, you can spin it around, you know, that says a, a life unexamined is also not worth living. You know, if you don't, if you don't look at what you're doing, what you, what your motivations are, what your desires, and then try to manifest those, like, what's the point? Is, is that, um, is that why you would say that? Because I mean, there's there's uh, there was a quote I think I saw on your web page that says it's never too late for a career change. Yep, <laughs> I'm living and proof of that. As are you. <laughs> well, I was going to say, yeah. Thank you for justifying this. You know, so now I make zip <laughs> money. Good, yeah, I'm on path. <laughs> right. I got absolutely nothing, and now I get mansplained. But. <laughs> validation <laughs> right <laughs> but i get to talk to people like you and i get mm. to there's so much i get to do so mm. what if you do have the mortgage the three cars you're paying for the children who have to go to cut two and a half children to go to college you know you've got to pay one's a community college maybe because it's two and a half is it too is that too late for a career change well i would I would challenge the person and say, because I think, I think we, we wake up somewhere in our lives and we have a very expensive life because the money has allowed us to build that up. Yeah. It's a bit like, you know, for us techies, you know, every time, every time we upgraded the bandwidth in, in the organization, it would be gone, you know, we'd be up at 90% again. It's like, you know, whatever you have, you spend or you, you make, you yes. buy an expensive car. There is a kind of come to Jesus moment that has to happen of like, what, what do you, you know, what lifestyle do you want to live versus what are you living versus what could you live? What would like versus what is the minimum? So I'm always slightly edged out by money being an issue. Like, you mm -hmm. know, I, I've built this amazing, you know, this very expensive lifestyle, but like on what and for what purpose? So I think you need to, you need to challenge, you need to challenge that to start with, you know? And and maybe yeah. it's like, well, until they finish university, I have to do this. Like, well, that's okay. At least that's conscious. The point is you will have many people I work with have found themselves, they've slept walk into where they are. And I think that's, that's an excellent yeah. way. And so, yeah, the, so the money thing needs to be challenged. Then the other thing is, do you want to be doing, which was my thing, I was, I turned 40 in, in the management consulting industry very, with a very sort of tech lens. And I thought, do I want to be doing this? when I'm 50, because for me, tech's quite a young person's industry. And I'm like, no, you know, and, the, and, and I made that choice because I was a people pleaser. My father said psychology wasn't a degree when I was 18. So I was, you know, more than 20 years in to living someone else's dream and path. And I kind of did very well and it's done, you know, I met great people and I had some fun, but if I, 
if I want to work until probably 70, which I'll have to, I've got 30 years. It's a whole freaking other chapter. Right. Right. So you know, there's like, can I, can I change and do something else? And my, you know, the answer for me was yes. Um, I don't think it has to be an entire career change. It could be, it could be, you know, are there passions or outlets that I have suppressed or ignored because I'm a workaholic and haven't allowed time for? Um, you know, places that you regenerate yourself, uh, pottery, you know, podcast on the side. There's an IT, IT network engineer that I was in an interview last week with and he runs, he runs IT for a school and he podcasts on the side. He's got 1,400 episodes. He does four episodes a week. Oh, my gosh. I know. Wow. Oh, holy cats. Yeah. So, but he gets huge pleasure out of it and he's very good. He's a very good interviewer. So, um, yeah, so there's an idea of finding something that lights him up that can go along with some grown-up expectations of on him of clearly providing for his family. Yeah. Right, right. It, it's interesting. I think that in part this describes why, I mean, I've seen this happen to several people because now I'm getting old enough to observe it. People, they work the, they work themselves so hard because they're thinking, well, I'm going to live my life after I retire. And then they retire at whatever, 62 or, you know, 65, whatever you can do. And then they have nothing left. There's just nothing left. And so within a year, you know, they're, they're, they've aged 10 years because they just have, they've given it all to work. And I, I don't remember who it was. Somebody I, I was talking to recently said, what you want to do is go to like a, a, be in hospice care. And listen to the regrets that people feel. Mm -hmm. No, you know, nobody says, geez, I wish I'd worked a little harder. You know, I wish <laughs> I'd been able to get that 15th car, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody cares. Yeah. But I, I wish I'd had a relationship with my son. He, you know, who, whoever it was I spoke to, you know, that was frequent. So <laughs> this is getting depressing. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> So, so what is it? I mean, we're talking about going and killing yourself at work. What is it that's mer that that merc? What is it that's missing at work? It was. It's actually. It's a new. It's a portmanteau. What merc? What's missing at work? Sorry. I'll start again. I may. I may just edit that bit. <laughs> what is it that is um that's missing from most workplaces? that can improve this sense of fun and make people more energized about going to work. And, and I think ultimately be more productive. What, what's mm. missing? Depends on the workplace, but potentially everything. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do a little audit. Starting from, <laughs> starting from the top. Um, Ooh, there's a, stuff. there's a great phrase that says the fish rots from the head down. So Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's good. And I know from some of your experiences, you've lived this too. So, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> and if you if you look at one of the main reasons why people will leave a workplace, it's for their man. It's because of their manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if you've got a bad manager, you know, toxic, bully, absent, incompetent, like whatever version you know, whatever shitty version of manager you have. That makes life intolerable. If you have a good manager, they can protect you from more systemic challenges. Like, yes. you know, you you know, I can imagine being, being a little umbrella, you know, over over your over your team, and you're protecting them and and creating and you and you have some you can create a culture that they like. You can create work styles and habits that that where people can thrive and protect you know, and protect them from whatever nonsense is happening in the rest of the organization. But if you are senior and you don't get much protection, things like organize, you know, meanings and you know, meaning and purpose, like what's, so I, you know, when I was consulting, I was helping, okay, this is, there's a boredom alert here, trigger warning, boredom alert. Um, <laughs> I was helping insurers, I can't even, so I'm, I'm even slowing down getting bored as I'm saying, <laughs> I, I helped insurers make investment decisions around claim management systems. I'm like, for fuck's sake, like, who gives a shit? <laughs> Seriously. Uh, and that, I mean, that was part of the reason for like, like anything else is going to be better than this. <laughs> anything. 
mean, like insurers <laughs> in themselves, like really. So <laughs> we we want to get out of the field. Yeah, I mean, we totally get it. You don't want to talk to us. We don't want to talk to us. You know. Uh, so yeah, there's something about hard. Where you know, one of, one of my clients works for a um, uh, a charity in the northern and uh, north of England, where they take care of um, sort of mentally disabled people who need social care services. So it's like extra, it's sort of extra support and care for the well being of of these people who often get marginalised. Um, and the purpose of the organization and how the leadership team shows up and the values that they have identified about making an impact are so profound. Like I don't even work with them and I get excited hearing hmm. about them. Like I would love to work for them. And they're, it's a charity organization. They get charity salaries, which is, you know, very low. And, but you sure. wouldn't, you wouldn't know like these, you know, they work, they work, they work, working hard is not a measure of, I want to, I want to amplify, but they, you know, they show up, they do their work, they have fun and they all feel like they're making a, a, um, an impact on the broader society for people who otherwise get marginalized. Like that's, that would be a place, you know, that's a very different workplace from what I was doing. It's, a, it's an unfortunate mix that they're a charity. Everyone's going to say, well, not everyone can be a charity, but you know, take, you can take, Patagonia, you know, a commercial organization, but the values in which they structure themselves and how you know they don't take they don't partake in um cyber what's it, Cyber Friday? Black no, what's the one? Yeah, Cyber Monday. Cyber Monday, yeah. They don't partake in that. Everyone the employees get a day off. You know, an, an organization who's makes fun consumer goods, but does it in a way that everyone can get behind and get excited about. So yeah, I think that's more of a sort of a systemic organizational lens on, you know, why workplaces can suck. Um, and then, and you've got the individual, you know, fish head, fish head lens too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you also get a surprising number of accidental managers. I mean, I just want to shout, I think yeah, some, right. somebody said the other day it was like 66% of managers are accidental. So the chances are your boss never signed up to be, in the, in that position has no training, right. has no support, has right. a has a boss who's in the same position. You're like, well, that's not going to work out well. No, certainly not. You wouldn't expect it to. Mm -hmm. So, if I mean, let me try to to summarize a bit of what you said. The because I've I saw this in in teams that I've led that if you can provide a sense of meaning. Mm -hmm. I think that's really it because I don't, I don't know that it needs to be the, um, the the like the industry. I don't think no. it needs to be a charity. No, I Cause, agree. Because there there was a team. There was a team. That, in fact, the very last team I led as a W two employee. The the biggest thing that I brought to that team was was a sense of direction. I mean, in my opinion, like, cause, cause I don't think I'm everything, you know, I, as when I left, people were like, well, you know, thanks very much for being a great manager. And I was like, I didn't do anything other than enable you. And then I realized, well, that's no, that is the point. That is what, what good leadership is. But I tried to give a sense of purpose. And I said, here's why we're doing this. Here's mm -hmm. how it's going to help the, the, the customer. And here's how it helps the company. And so I don't, so I don't know if it needs to be a particular industry so much as I agree. I guess just leadership. <clears throat> there's a, there's a wonderful, possibly apocryphal story about um, <laughs> JFK visiting NASA before the first launch in this, whatever it was, the sixties and speaking to the cleaner, we said, do you, do you enjoy your job? And the cleaner, you know, janitor, whatever is like, yeah, I'm putting someone on the moon. Like, that's amazing. Right. You know, so to link that, like what I am doing, however small or however I see my piece of work, how it fits into the jigsaw piece puzzle of what we are doing. Um, right. Maybe that's meaningful for you. Maybe it's not. But it's like I understand where I fit in and how my work um, contributes. Like the, one of the biggest ways of demotivating people is to get them to do work that never gets acknowledged or seen or used. Right. Yeah. Right. Very much. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. Victor Frankel has a great, uh, a whole book about that, right? <clears throat> about some of the, um, 
some of the tactics used in in mm-hmm. concentration camps, mm-hmm. you know, just to demotivate. Yeah. It wasn't even uh, it wasn't even violence. It was psychological. Yeah, so, yeah psychological yeah, warfare. Yeah, yeah. So all of this leads into part of what what you and I spoke about on your podcast, which is authenticity at work in particular. Because I mean, I think leadership. Hmm. How do I want to put this? If you're going to give somebody a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, you have to figure out how they relate to it. And so you have to know who that person is, which I think is one of the most difficult parts of leadership and why you have accidental managers who just Mm -hmm. fail at it because they have no empathy. They go, well, I don't even know. I don't care who I'm working with. It doesn't make a difference. You're a cog in a wheel. Do what Mm -hmm. I told you to do. And when you have that depersonalization, dehumanization, I think that's what kills it. So this is that's my opinion. But so, so authenticity, because I know you're big on authenticity. Why is that important? I mean, how does that contribute? I think I could talk about it, but I'd rather have you because <laughs> people listen to me all the time. So, well, not really, but you know. Yeah, there's there's a there's a um, leadership assessment tool that I use called the Leadership Circle Profile, uh, and it's sort of a 360 feedback tool, and you come back with this little chart. But there's two there's two aspects or, or tenets of leadership in that model around integrity and courageous authenticity. And courageous authenticity in that model, which I just love the definition of, is about being able to speak up. Is to be able to speak truth to power, which is, would, and then the other one is integrity, which is do do we see you showing up in what we think is your value system? Right. So it's a very sensitive right. thing. It's like, like you lack integrity, but is, do we have a sense? And they're intertwined because, so some people will score quite low in integrity, and they get completely triggered. Like, what my colleagues are saying, I don't have integrity. And I'm like, no. The the question for you is much more. Do, do your colleagues know who you are and do your colleagues mm-hmm. feel that you walk your talk? And if they don't know who you are, they don't know if you're walking your talk. So like sure. you may be back to accidental manager. You may be a very competent subject matter expert, but in a leadership position, that's not relevant. Yeah. Do I get it? Do I, do I get a sense of the person? And in, in, in building a sense of the person, I can trust you. I will follow you. If you tell me this is important, then I will do it because I trust your you and your judgment, and I will and I will do it. Yeah. So, so the upsides for this is you know authenticity and relationship relationship building, and and in that requires a degree of vulnerability. A client told me a story of she went to a networking event. She hates. She's an introvert. Hates networking. Has been made redundant and chose very bravely to to tell people she was made redundant at this networking event. It was completely blown away by the goodwill that that built. People were like, oh, well, let me, I can do this and I'll introduce you to that. Like, she's like, oh my God, I was like, she said, the takeaway for me was in daring to talk about something that I feel quite ashamed about being made redundant, that people, first of all, didn't judge me at all for being made redundant because it's not on me. And sure. and then that vulnerability allowed for people to to offer something back. Um, yeah, I would think it was a beautiful example. Yeah, it becomes a connection. Yeah, definitely. You use the phrase. I want to circle back really quickly. You use the phrase "speak truth to power." Can Can you expand on that or expand on that? I got that right. I hope right. It was speak no, truth you, to yeah, power. Yeah, no, you I did. I, I'm trying to find like what would I, how would I, what would I say about that? Um, I, 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 I wonder if perhaps when people think of authenticity, they go, uh, you know, oh, I can just you know wear my purple glasses and just be me and shave my head and you know like that's sure. who I am authentically, you know. You're like, well, that's right. not I'm really. Wear a speedo to work. Yeah, <laughs> it's like that's authenticity um, is not so I'm, much how you physically present. Dis- it's a- disclaimer, though. I haven't done that. Okay, I have not worn a speedo to work. 
<laughs> since the 90s. Same with you, I think, right? I've never, so worn, I've never worn a Speedo. I don't have a bikini, so we're okay. <laughs> the world is safe. <laughs> Look at me, Catherine. I never wore a Speedo. Come on. <laughs> So I'm so, sorry. Speaking yeah, so power it's, it's to truth. Speak so truth I think it's an interesting topic because I think people get authenticity mixed up with speaking your mind. So either either presenting as I want to, you know, you know, this is my this is how I want to present in my wacky glasses and my mismatched socks, or sure. you know, this is this is a boring meeting. Well, like. That, that is your internal dialogue, but and that may be authentically your internal dialogue, but the world isn't any better because you've put it out there. Sure. So the courageous authenticity is to is is a, is a is taking the internal authentic thoughts and going, what is the how do I want to impact what is happening around me for the positive? So let's I take a, that simple example of it's a very boring meeting that's being very badly run. Does it entail, because here's what I hear, the ability to, to be, hmm, the ability to be, I'm trying to come up with a good way, because I'm thinking like making a connection to your leadership, being able to, to say, well, this is how this would impact me and how that would impact you. Mm -hmm. And so, so that there's a circle, because usually management's like, I need you to go do this. And you go, well, I, Okay. I mean, is there a reason? No, go do it. Yes, there's a reason because I said go do it. Yeah. <laughs> Even better answer, right? It's like my mother, you know. It's, is that is that along those lines? The ability to um, the ability to have like an, an actual interaction with those who are in leadership. Yeah. So for me, I guide people into what is the influence you want to have in the room. So saying okay. I'm bored, you're just being a sulky, annoying person. Yeah. <laughs> it's about re it's, I mean, or in, in or common parlance today, millennial. That's the uh, <laughs> you said it on me. <laughs> and it's untrue. It's such bullshit. You know, this it's a it's a cheap, it's a cheap excuse for what you're about to say, and I'm gonna yeah, stop for bad, interrupting. Yeah, for, you. for vocalizing your authentic inner voice. Yeah. Right. But right. <clears throat> what's much more powerful is to say, I'm, you know, internal dialogue. This is inside Catherine. This is a very boring meeting. It's not going anywhere. I notice I'm getting frustrated. I'm pretty sure other people are as well. So how do I change that? Mm. So the, the speak, the truth to power, because there's always some form of power dynamic in the room, is, wow, I'm noticing I'm really, um, I'm really struggling to stay focused. I'm not sure what the agenda was. Like, how's everyone else? How's everyone else doing? Are you tracking what the agenda is? Or I would I would love if we could just recontract and what we are looking for from the outcomes to the meeting. That takes a lot of courage to do. But the yes. outcome of that is to influence the meeting for the better of the group rather than for you to have the authentic voice of, this is boring. The true true story given me today. <laughs> And a client of mine who has some visibility on another organization, one of the senior people, when she's bored, gets up from the, from the table and lies on the floor. And her colleagues okay. go, oh, there she is again. She's bored. We need to move on. I'm like, it just, I mean, it's a perfect example of like that may be a very authentic expression for her, but it's massively unhelpful. Mm. So Absolutely. the courageous, authentic expression is to have the courage to speak to what is going on in the room in order to influence for the positive, for the for the general, for the you know, for the larger group and your broader purpose, organizational team purpose. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Because I agree. Usually, if you if you bring up authenticity, somebody bringing their true self, their authentic self to work, you usually get leadership going. Yeah, but then Amy's going to show up in a speedo, and that's that's going to be distracting, if nothing else, you know, distracting, possibly disgusting. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I'm just trying to be honest. And that, but that's the that's the thought that people have around authenticity. But you're saying that authenticity is still integrating into a business environment. Okay. 
So, and, I, and I think also authenticity and professionalism can get collapsed. So we need sure. to we need to remember that professionalism and therefore authenticity is defined by white men. You know, just there look up that. look up unprofessional hairstyles on Google uh, as an exper as a thought ex as a visual not thought experiment as a visual experiment to understand yeah. what what is seen as un, un, unprofessional. Yeah, and so there is there is some sort of radical reclamation here of you know what is what's what's authentic and what's professional. Um, so the the. The rebel in me would would stir the pot a little bit on that, um, but yeah, it's a, it, you you want to speak up with what outcome? Yeah, it, it would be the would be the inquiry I would give to people wanting to be more authentic, or do right. the thing with what outcome intended. Yeah, and for whose benefit? But you you also raise the question of like what's the I mean you're you're, you're talking about what's the downside here as well, and I think mm -hmm. managers in particular. The accidental managers. One of their worst, one of their nightmare scenarios is conflict. Yes. Yeah, because no one has the skills to have the conflict. Right. Uh, I was, you know, we, we're fast approaching the UK ele general elections here, and so I posted something on on LinkedIn about should we be able to have political discussions at work. Uh, and and the response is like no, <laughs> like I'm not saying debate either side of the debate. I'm like just to be able to say I you know this is my leaning and this is why and and like what's yours and all that's interesting and but it comes down to the fun the fundamental lack of skill that many of us have and I'm you know I put myself in there as well. Uh, we don't know how to have the difficult conversations. And so that's the fear of, you know, if you're authentic and if you do, that, that's, the, that's the leadership fear of authenticity is, you know, mm -hmm. people get upset and people, you know, ruffle, you know, feathers will get ruffled. I'm like, damn straight, let's do it. Like, let's build some resilience around these hard conversations. If we can't have a little hard conversation at work, how are we going to so solve a burning planet? Like, like, we need to grow up. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. and, and for what it's worth, I mean, I think that, it is that that conflict that ultimately draws us closer together. Because if you can resolve it, yeah. if it turns into you're a jerk, no, you're a jerk. But that's back okay, to skills, <laughs> right? So then you're back into toxic behavior of you know yes, of, of right. blaming the four horsemen of the apocalypse, um, as yeah. it's called. Um, which yeah, which is still resolvable if people will take some responsibility for how they're, how they're showing up and what's being triggered, what's mm -hmm. being activated. I think that's another thing we don't acknowledge in the workplace is the degree to which our own family wounds are played out in the workplace. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. I can't, I mean, this is how my mind works anyway, but I can't, I can't help but relate this back to, to a thought that's been running through my head recently about social environments because i've i've been thinking about social constructs in particular recently i'm not going to tell you why but the point being that that when we use that for okay i'm going to tell you why because it actually is context much of the the debate in the uk and in the us is the idea that gender is a social construct mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if Social construct. If a social construct is some is a a word or a phrase given meaning by the society that accepts it, then it means all of society has to define it. In which case, you get people who go, "Well, I define gender as an XXXY genotype." Done. And then somebody else goes, "Well, I define it as whether or not I wear a skirt." And now you have two competing definitions, and how do you get past that? Because now you've just gone to definitions, and there's it's not that's not even a debate. Because you can just go, yeah, it is. No, it isn't. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Nah. Mm -hmm. And you're done. The reason I'm bringing any of this up is to say that I think we want to believe there's only one social environment, and that mm -hmm. authenticity assumes there's only one social environment, and your interaction is the same with each of them. Mm -hmm. But it can never be the case. It, it will mm -hmm. never be the case. 
it's different social environment at work. It's a different social environment at home. You go to the grocery store, different social environment. There isn't only one. Unlike the Highlander, in which there is only one. <laughs> but we're not talking about him. We're talking about social environments. So, and I, I, think the, it's, I, I think it's a really good point that would help people listening to this because I think there is a perhaps a sort of shorthand here of if I'm authentic I'm the same person as I am at home and at work right. and the point is right. it's not that you're not the same but you're in different roles so you might be you know a lover or a parent at home and then you're you know the head of finance at work um then you're a student potter in the pottery studio and, you know, with each of the roles and, you know, I do this in team coaching. We talk about what role are you occupying and roles in the systemic coaching perspective is a, is an, is a psychological need of a system. So if you, th if you think of any sort of leadership team, you're going to have the harmonizer, <coughs> the big thinker, <coughs> right. the disruptor, all those roles exist. Some will be occupied by a human being. So you might be, you know, the disruptor, I might be the harmonizer, but then we've got no one doing the strategic thinking. And what, when you realize those roles are missing, then you're like, well, as a leadership team, we can't have no one doing strategic thinking. Like, can we, right. can we, can we extend our range and kind of go there for the sake of the, of the system? Yes, we can. And I think there's something like, does it, if I'm, if I'm living the, if I'm leaning into systems think, sorry, into strategic thinking, because our team needs that. Does it make me inauthentic? No. You know, it, you know, it, it's tapping into part of me. You know, I am, I am everything and more than what you see. Right. Right. Your, I remember how you put it. You had said people see authenticity as being the same person, no matter where, where they go. <clears throat> And at least within my own theory of identity, like that's still true because you have, well, I mean, my theory of identity is the idea that there is an origin that is untouchable and that is the person you always are. It's a set of knowledge that you know you know, but you may not necessarily know why you know it. My canonical example, you know, what's your favorite vegetable? Like, I can't tell you you're wrong. You can't go, oh, it's mm -hmm. broccoli. And I go, no, it's asparagus. Um, so you're the same person. But the rest of my theory of identity is that we have a negotiation with our social environment. Yeah. So, so there's the person you know you are, and there's a level of safety. And, and I guess I'm going to have to throw in there like consideration. I don't even know what the word I want to use is. But so, yes, you bring that origin of identity everywhere you go. But there's still a different negotiation process of negotiation depending upon the social environment. Yeah. I like I like where this is going <laughs> for I, what it's worth. <laughs> I, I completely agree with you. I have a few um a few clients, um black black women, and they talk about having to manage themselves to not be seen as the angry black woman. So, so to express some form of dissent coming from me as a white person, they say to me, if if I said that to the room, which I'm like, that's fine, go ahead. And they're like, no, 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 that it's not safe for me to come across as that because then I get pigeonholed into be the angry black woman and then I lose all the platform oh. that I have. So I think the – and this, there's a black woman who does a TED talk on how – why it's – I forget what it is, but something like don't be authentic at work – um, so I think, you know, we, we need to speak to the fact that there are marginalized people, um, you know, which, which you can relate to for where it's not safe to show up for who you mm -hmm. are, um, mm -hmm. however authentic you are. And so you're back to your, your theory, like you are, um, modifying yourself or adapting yourself to the social environment based on the level of safety that you feel, which I think is absolutely yeah. mandatory. Yeah. 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 Can we, we started talking about the feminine in particular being feminine in technology. I mean, I think that's a good pivot. I mean, I think that, uh, 
the technology industry is very, I would almost say antagonistic to femininity. And I find that somewhat ironic for what it's worth, because most of the people you find in technology are not exactly Adonis. <laughs> You're not talking about the manliest of men there, right? <laughs> so, so, so showing up as, as somewhat less than masculine, I think, is really kind of common <laughs> in technology. But why? Because you spent, you said you spent 20 years in, yeah. in tech as, yeah. as a woman, the whole time presenting as a woman. Yeah, yeah. What, what were some of the challenges you, you had to face and, and push through? Well, I mean, I started, so I did my BSc in the early 90s and I was, we were five women in the graduating class of 85. Oh, and, gosh. <laughs> and, the, and the men looked like complete freaking geeks, like, you know, bottle, oh, yeah. glass, bottle glasses, like the whole, the whole, yeah. you know, the kid that never got chosen for sport at school, like the whole lot, right? I mean, I mean yeah, the girls, right, like, no, girls are pretty geeky as well. Like, I'm not, you know, not that we would, I, but... You're, I, you're, I 100% identify with this. I get what you're saying. <laughs> stereotype is like, is a reason, is this the reason why this is a stereotype? And right. then some, like somewhere in the nineties, tech got cool. And I remember feeling right. part of, you know, like Google came out and it was all, you know, because in the early days it was Fortran and COBOL and mainframes and boring. And, right. and I mean, it was, it was uncool. And somewhere in there, I think the tech industry realize they could be the next cool kids yeah um and so i think i think that gave them a lot of um courage uh you know to do things and go places that they would have Mm -hmm. and i mean you know the tech there was a joke about the tech you know tech will rule the world you know i mean then that's where we we find ourselves today but to answer your question i I think i i think i just became like a man in the first probably 10 years. Yeah. I, I, I didn't have any, there was no, there was, you know, there was no modeling of, how, not much modeling of, of women in leadership. Certainly no modeling that I sub- would subscribe. I mean, they were complete fucking bitches, these women, right? Oh, sure. You know, sharp shoulders, suits and, you know, terse and staccato. And like, I mean, you know, I'm much more terrified of them than any other man that I had to deal with. Um, because they were ahead of me and had done exactly the same the same thing. So I think the first, yeah, I don't know, maybe I haven't really thought about the timing. But there's a first, there's a chunk of time where you're like, well, I just need to play. That's the game. So I, I play that game, um, and completely losing myself. Like I'd be in on the boys' jokes, and I would I could drink them under the table, and you know I was completely embraced as one of the boys. Which felt good, right? Like, like to be accepted at some level, even if for some part that wasn't really me, it it, it felt good. Um, but I think as I got into leadership roles, I I realized that didn't work. Didn't always didn't always work well for me because I felt like I would be challenged. Then I'd be mm-hmm. almost challenged to like a rutting competition, you know, because you're you're not yes. in leadership, and now we're now we have to rut with you to prove dominance. I'm like, I, that's not. I can tell really bad jokes, but I'm not getting into rutting competitions. Like that's that's the line for me. <laughs> <Funny that. laughs> it's a weird line, but that's the hill I'm going to die on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but, I think there was more, the, you know, the cultural background, the cultural context is important here, yeah, and you know, you and I are yes. the similar age, right? There was no feminism was around, but it wasn't at work. I don't know where it was. There were certainly no feminist leaders in my sphere or in the workplace that I was at. I that you know it was over over indexed on tech bro male people on the spectrum. So in you know, emotional intelligence and emotional you know, IQ was like very low. Sure. So you get gaslit in some way because you're like, am I why like this is my experience? And everyone's like, no, it's not. Okay, maybe it's not. Um, so I think, I think to be honest, I think I got free of it when I left corporate. Like I can now see how much I compromised myself. The last corporate job I had was much more forgiving. Had a much a really had a really great leader. Had two great leaders actually, really decent human beings, um, who supported me and, and gave me a lot of leeway. And 
I learned an awful lot um, yeah. about about positive role, you know, role models and role leaderships. But I look around now and I, it's still hard to see. I one of my um, aspirations for the next season of the podcast is to do the anti, the non John or the anti Dick podcast, anti Dick CEO <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Yeah, right. with a stat, if your listeners don't know, you know, depending on the UK or the US, there are more dicks in the US or Johns in the UK who are called CEOs called that name than they are women. So the lack of diversity in board and board level is is I mean C suite level is absolutely appalling. Um where am I going on this thread? Uh, <laughs> oh, so so one of the challenges was that I was I was talking to someone about this idea and she goes you're going to have a hard time doing that. I'm saying it's only 10 episodes. You see, yeah, but 10 episodes with, with female, you know, CEOs, are, you know, who are oh. of BIPOC or LGBTQ plus or, or disabled. I mean, when we're, she's like, she's good luck with that. Just, just finding the guests. Just, find, just finding oh, the guests. God. And you're like, yeah, you're right. Because I think a lot of them leave, uh, they leave, they do what I do, which is go out and go, go sell entrepreneur. Or mm-hmm. freelance or what, whatever it is. Like you right, take yourself right. out of that um, for mental health reasons and work reasons. So yeah, yeah. the systemic cost of, of, of the, you know, the lack of feminine, embracing the feminine in the tech industry is profound. Right. The way you put it, I mean, I've used this word as well, play the game. Yeah. Because it's really what it is. You, you get into something and, and, there's an expectation, a social expectation on how you're going to, yeah. how you're going to act in technology. And it's, it's, it's absolutely destructive. Yeah. And I have an idea on that. You, you said that tech started to become cool. And then at some point you had Steve Ballmer <laughs> boun- bouncing around on stage going developers. Yeah, was, he, was he ever cool? I don't know. No, come on. <laughs> Steve, Steve was never yeah, I mean that was Microsoft. Microsoft was not the cool cat. Was never cool. No, 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 no. no. I know, but you, but like it started being cool. Then you've got developers, developers, de- <laughs> set the whole tech, the industry back at least a decade. You know, <laughs> with all of a sudden people are like, wait, are you still using Fortran? And you're like, no, we've got we've got new thing. Hmm. Shit. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> but like you said, it was Microsoft, which never oozed cool no just never they did use a rolling stone song though i mean you know yeah that's branding (laughs) good point you can do a lot around branding (laughs) right here's our external face here's our internal yeah there was a there was a there was a windows version boot up song with which is it was an eddie eddie brickle song or something like that it was a riff oh really yeah, and I was—I thought that was. I mean, it bought the song. It was so cool. So I mean, yeah, there's there's ways of putting lipstick on a pig, and Microsoft was always pretty good at that. <laughs> they had the money for it. that. Was the thing with tech? I I think it became cool because yeah. all of a sudden there's so much money. You just go look. We're gonna buy the best goddamn marketing you can find. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got. Uh, of course, now that big marketing com- consulting company throw, falls out of my head, but. McKinsey? Who the hell am I thinking of? Oh, like uh, WBD or whatever. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sure. And, yeah. <laughs> then, but branding. Yeah, you're like, look, we can afford great branding, you know. But, but it's really, it's really disappointing to think that we have to, that we have to to shutter ourselves, in order to be successful. Yeah. Because the the number one thing that I've seen, so I'm going to give you another example, even though we're supposed to be talking. Um, that last team that I led, I, we had terrible productivity. And as soon as, uh, you know, and this isn't on me, this was just sort of, that's something that seemed to sen- uh, to make sense. <clears throat> but as soon as we had like a common goal, because what I came into, by the way, just quick aside, what I came into was a very antagonistic relationship between the back end developers and the front end developers. And this antagonism, you know, the the sense was, you know, if you're working on the web side of it, you don't you don't know anything about the database and you're not supposed to. And if you work on the front end, then you're not supposed to know anything about the web code. And I think that's total 
crap. I mean, you can't have a system that that's two separate parts that don't talk. So, but one, once that, once there was a common identity for this development team that we are a team that makes a product, it improved, well, productivity. I hate the idea of saying mm. productivity of the product, mm. but you know, but it was a common identity for the team. Mm. So everybody had a common goal and it took everybody's personal, unique contribution to do that. Now I can say this and you can say that, yeah, that was probably really, really valuable, but how do we, how do you express that? Like there's more dicks, more Johns <laughs> than women CEOs, but I think it's really easy for somebody to go, well, what if women aren't just, just aren't good at being CEOs? Uh, how, how do we, how do we make that message clear? Like that, that, women will be good in leadership, that women are necessary in leadership. How do you make that point? Is that not the cultural calling of the current um, version of feminism? <laughs> it feels like a really big question. Um, <clears throat> is it? I'm, I mean... It depends. Like what? Like if we're if we're still trying to prove that women make good leaders, well, then I'm disappointed. Um, <laughs> I think there's a different there's a different convers there's different buckets of conversations depending on the question into that. Like one of them is like, sure, if we have to prove that women are good leaders, that's one conversation. If the other conversation is how do we get more women into leadership, or why don't they stay in leadership, or you know, different, Excellent point. Different conversation because there's there is yeah. data that I've seen that shows um, certainly more inclusive boards, more rep more you know uh, broader representation of, of a population should make much better decisions and are financially better performing in the longer term. Yeah. Um, that's <clears throat> so. I mean, do we do we want to have the conversation about do women make better leaders? <laughs> well. Because you brought up feminism, which I think is a great point. You said, "Isn't that the current cultural problem of feminism?" I think is how you put it. Or the the, yeah, the yeah. cultural milieu. I said that really poorly, and I'm I'm unsure because most of what I see feminism pushing today, and I'm by the way, I want to point out, all my life I've considered myself a feminist, mm. and but that's because, gosh, I guess it was 1918. Who knows? It was like late 80s, and I had this French TA at, at college as, a, as an undergraduate who taught me that feminism was respecting the feminine and, and seeking an integration. Mm -hmm. This is you and I spoke mm -hmm. about seeking an integration between the, the beneficial parts of the feminine and the beneficial parts of the masculine, that that would be true feminism, would be... Seeing the seeing feminism is equally important as the masculine. And my take, and this is not a popular one, but my take is a lot of what I've seen in feminism has been exactly what you just described, which is you had to play a game. Mm -hmm. And it was, we want women to play this game to be CEOs just like the men. And I think, no, not like the men. Don't be like the men. That's the point. Be like yeah. women in leadership because women in leadership are strong and powerful and valuable and valid like men can be. But I think we're looking at enough toxicity that we can go, well, this is not working exceptionally well. Yeah. So. I, I, yeah, I think I, the, the challenge I think women leaders can face is that they're probably 20 years into their career, maybe more. And so the water that they've been swimming in is patriarchy and misogyny. And so they end up internalizing some of that, a lot of it, some of it, whatever. You know, they mm -hmm. are a product of the system which they are surviving in. Uh, and so it right. gets murky. Yeah, I think I think – can you be a feminist and an unconscious misogynist? Yes. You know, you know, can you end up perpetuating right. the very, the very behaviors 
that you've claimed are anti-feminist. Yeah. But I think there's yeah. some compassion and kindness. Like we can't change, you know, systems like these take a take a long time. You know, we are yeah. hundreds of years into patriarchy. Um, it takes a long time to change this. And there are a lot of very powerful forces who benefit from the status quo. Um, right. And, you know, women or those with you know, um, feminine energies don't necessarily have the power, the money and the power and the influence. Yeah. That's true. So, I th yeah, I think I would say, you know, small, st you, you make your small steps in your way in the best way that you can is, you know, there's, there's an individualistic lens and then there's a systemic lens. I think, you know, just own what you can and be kind and compassionate to yourself in a world that you know, still wants to take away women's rights. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I mean, I would pitch that as restrict identity period. Yeah. Cause I mean, that goes for yeah. the LGBTQ community, LGBTQ. women. Yeah. I mean, you know, other, other marginalized communities. So. But that's it. You know, there's a wonderful thing doing the rounds at the moment, um, which I keep sending to my female clients, which is, May you have the confidence of a mediocre white man. <laughs> <laughs> and the world is defined by mediocre white men. Absolutely. And for the Absolutely. rest of us, you've got to work, you know, extra hard. You'll get yeah. penalized, talked down to, mansplained, like, you know, welcome. Right. Welcome to, you know, in that case, womanhood. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, to... And we're running low on time, but I will, here's here's one last one last interesting point I think or to to discuss. If you because you said the world is defined by mediocre white men, and I have heard, at least by mediocre white men, the opinion the opinion expressed, yeah, well that's just racism and sexism right there. You've defined, you've said this is a problem because I'm white and male. That's racism. That's racist and sexist to bring that up. Do, I mean, do you have a, do you have an answer to that? I think that. Oh, and then, oh, you mean like you're being reverse racist to me now because yes. I'm, yeah. Okay. Right. Right. And, and it comes from the mediocre white men who are being yeah, accused, yeah, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. But, yeah. You know. I mean, it's the, it's, I mean, there's a whole reason why the manosphere exists, <laughs> exists because they feel like they're being discriminated against. But, um, <laughs> I mean, any any isms, racism or, or, or um, patriarchy, gender bias, you have to ask how have you benefited sure. from the system that isn't currently in place? Well, how sure. have you been disadvantaged? And so until a mediocre white man can list to me ways that he has been disadvantaged in the current system that I'm not willing to entertain his is his, his uh, fragile ego. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> that is a hill I'm willing to die on. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I mean, you know, not willing to entertain his fragile ego. Well, I think there, well, there is. A, there is a, and this comes from. So we talk about feminine and masculine energies, right? There is a call on us with – so I identify as one, but there is a call on me as well to show up with some masculine energy. And sometimes it's like sure. absolutely not. I'm not having that conversation. Yeah. And so that's the sort of I'm not entertaining your fragile ego at this point. Sure, right? sure. So I, and I that's think for, integration. For, yeah, for a lot of us who are – collaborative and want to have conversations we can go too far and then we lose ourselves you know right. so I, and this is something i've had to learn in the last 10 years so like you know where is the line of the conversation i'm willing to have yeah because back to one of your earlier points like we could we could argue the black you know this is it's right or it's wrong you think it's right i think it's wrong and fine you yeah. but <laughs> but but yeah arguing with system yeah, you know, people who who are in charge of systems of oppression is not where i'm going to spend my time it's it's a good point mm -hmm. it's a great point 
well, well, where can um, where can people find Catherine Stag Macy if they want to hear more more about what you do and, and how it all works? More of these die. Where do I? Where am I dying on the hill? Um, so you can, <laughs> right. <laughs> you can find the podcast Unsaid at Work on any platform of your choice, and you can find the website uh, Conversations at the Edge co uk. Um, because I'm all about edgy conversations, which uh, yes, yes, I think we might have had a sense of what that's about today. Uh, and then I'm on I'm on LinkedIn as well. So Stag Macy, there is only one Stag Macy on LinkedIn. You can't really get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's the upside and the downside of social media. There is only one Stag Macy out there. Right, right. There are very few amethysts as well. It's easy. That's to find. true. That's true. <laughs> Good choice. Do you, do you use your your Instagram? Oh no, it was not a purposeful thing. Believe me, but <laughs> do you use your Instagram at all? Yes, I do. Yes, yeah. so, so at Stag Macy um, as an Instagram handle um, is the okay. corporate. Yeah, is the my kind of business facing Instagram. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Catherine, thank you so much. I mean, you know, every time I talk to you, which has been a you know quite a few hours at this point. I feel I learn and I feel I grow. And now that that sounded vaguely, you know, uh, mealy mouthed and kind of cheesy is, is where I'm going. But it's true. I, you, I, I'll take it. I, I I feel always energized by a conversation with this. Just so thank you for having me on you. your podcast. Yeah. No, you you're you're you know you you are thought provoking and uh, and I like that. It's it's very energizing. So mm. very much. Thank you. Sure. So I guess with that, I will also thank our listeners, both of them. And uh, hey, I got two listeners too. <laughs> four listeners. All right, so all four of you. <laughs> you know that um, that particular joke. I wish I could remember how it was. I was trying to say. I can't remember what I was trying. I was trying to say something about both of us, but I said both of our listeners, and I went. <laughs> Oops, both of our listeners. <laughs> well, I meant, I meant, sorry, I meant listeners from both of us. Yes, yeah. But I said both, both of our listeners. And I went, wait, both of our, yeah, Jim and Judy, thanks very much for listening to this. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> this mom. Too. Love ya. Right. <laughs> mom and then my little sister. Thanks. Really appreciate it <laughs> for continuing to support this show. <laughs> <laughs> God. So thank you so much to all the listeners. <clears throat> I am Amethysta Herrick, and I've been talking with Catherine Stag Macy on Gender Identity Weekly about being feminine in a masculine world, masculine world as well as fragile egos. So thank you again. <laughs> yeah.